Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here's some of the stories we're following tonight. A lot of people here in parts of California are wet, muddy, and miserable as the amount of water they're dealing with is causing everything from evacuations to road closures to mudslides. Meanwhile, in Texas, a massive court case is underway. And at the center of it, what is widely seen as the most common abortion pill out there. Now, a federal lawsuit against the FDA could end with that pill being taken off the market. I, you know, I graduated from high school in 68 when we didn't have birth control. I know what it's like for young women to not have it. And on Wall Street, stocks tumbled today, mostly because investors can't seem to shake the worry our banking system is in trouble. And now signs those fears could be spreading globally as well. Also tonight, the second largest school district in the country is on the verge of shutting down as Los Angeles teachers plan a three-day strike. And coming to a body near you, 3D printed organs? The science is here, but what does that future look like? And millions of people across the country are dealing with the aftermath of two intense storms out in the east and here in the west. People on the east coast are digging themselves out of a bunch of snow that nor'easter just left behind. And we're going to have more on that in just a bit. But first, let's start right here in California because the latest storm left parts of the state in chaos. Firefighters had to clean up this huge mudslide yesterday in Placer County. Dozens of people were asked to evacuate. And while that property was severely damaged, thankfully, no one was hurt. And here in L.A. County, the fire department made this heroic rescue at the Santa Fe Dam where people were stranded on a little island because of all that rain. And then further down in Orange County, people were evacuated after landslides put their apartments in a very gnarly situation. Homes hanging off of edges where the land around it gave way. Uh, joining us now is NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin. Dana, let's talk about those people that were evacuated this morning in San Clemente. Uh, are we still seeing some houses teetering on the edges of cliffs right now? Well, Gotti, four apartment buildings with multiple units were evacuated this morning. And I just spoke to the fire captain moments ago. He said the ground is still giving way. That's why residents have not been allowed back inside. Luckily, no one was hurt, but it could take several days because right now county officials are trying to assess the damage there and make sure that it's safe for residents to get back in. And again, Gotti, it could be several days. And is that new to people that are living in Orange County? I know that I've been here for a while. This definitely feels new for Los Angeles. <sighs> You know, I think it's a little bit of both. Remember, this is the 11th atmospheric river system that we have seen so far this year. So that's a little uncommon and people are not used to that. But one woman in Baldwin Hills, an area where they had another slide this morning, she has an interesting way of gauging if a mudslide is imminent. Listen. When you start seeing the water drain in the gutter like this, the curb, when you start seeing it muddy, that's a sign that you got to start really paying attention to where the mud is coming from. That lets you know that the ground is really getting saturated. I know that's not scientific, but that's the sign that I've always used. And Gotti, I don't know if you've ever used that tip, but I thought that was really interesting. And the woman that you just heard from says that she is not surprised that we are seeing these mudslides in the area. Gotti? It, not scientific, but it makes so much sense. And it also makes me look behind you. I know that's the L.A. River. It looks muddy. Uh, hopefully there's not a lot of mud in there. I know it's just dirty water. But I do want to ask about Pajaro, uh, California right now. They're, they're reeling from the aftermath of that levee breach. What's the latest there? Yeah, Gotti, so there, there are still evacuation orders in place in Monterey County. And overnight, we saw people handing out food to those impacted residents. And they're now assessing the damage, although the water is receding. You know, this is a farming community, so they are likely going to be impacted economically, not only from damaged crops, but for workers who are going to lose out on wages. Uh, California's Governor Gavin Newsom toured Monterey County today and said that, you know, California's got a brace for more of this, quote, weather whiplash because a 12th atmospheric river is expected early next week. Gotti? 12. Wow. Dana, thanks so much.
Meanwhile, a lot of New England is under so much snow right now. It is wild. Check this out. These were taken in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, and this isn't even the worst of it. Some parts of the region got like 30 inches of snow. Thousands of people are still without power in that part of the country, and all this snow and wind is making travel by air, land, or foot pretty dangerous. Uh, two hikers got stranded in Mount Washington State Park last night. They say the bad weather made it hard to see the trail. Search teams rescued them about six hours after they called 911. Uh, let's bring in NBC meteorologist Bill Karens right now. Bill, uh, are things going to start winding down on the east and west coasts? Yeah, things have. We get to catch our breath. And it's interesting. I, like, we've talked about how much snow has fallen in all of the mountains in the west. And it was like all winter long. All the northeast mountains were like, oh, yeah, we make snow. This was like the first huge snow dump. And the highest total, by the way, Reedsboro, Vermont, 42 inches of snow. So that's no joke. I mean, that's over three, almost three and a half feet of snow. Big cities didn't get as much. So the big windy storm is moving out. It's still pretty gusty out there. And as the sun sets, it's not going to be pleasant to be walking around in it. And in areas of California, our storm has now moved from California into the Four Corner region, but we still have thunderstorms in the desert areas of uh, just south of Las Vegas. Look at all the lightning strikes with this upper level low that's now kicking through, but that will be exiting here shortly. And then the storm tonight is going to be another dump of snow in areas of the Rockies, anywhere from the San Juan Mountains here near Durango up towards Aspen is going to get more snow, and we're going to get some uh, more powder out there in the mountains of Utah had a ton, even Jackson Hole, so all the ski resorts. And then tomorrow during the day. We'll see this moving out and then the storm will head into the plains. It does look like a decent amount of snow, enough for slippery conditions, maybe some school delays. You have Minneapolis to Mason City to Sioux City. Not much for you in Des Moines, none for you in Milwaukee or Chicago, but Green Bay will also get some too. So, got this storm to hit the West Coast. I mean, it left its mark. I mean, it's good to get hit in the middle of the night because downtown LA had three inches of rain last night, which is an incredible wow. storm. I, and we've been talking so much about the coasts this week, the East Coast, the West Coast. Uh, but I know our friends in the South, they are preparing for some, some pretty severe weather too, right? Yeah, we've done this a lot of times this winter. We're going to do it again tomorrow. It does look like we are going to see severe weather. Now, this doesn't look like a tornado outbreak. We could see thunderstorms that you know more off the ground, higher in the atmosphere. And that means usually those are big hail-producing storms. So we have a chance of golf ball to even baseball-sized hail, especially in this area from Dallas-Fort Worth towards Texarkana. This will be as we go towards late tomorrow afternoon into the evening hours and this area that we've hatched in yellow and white here including Sherman uh, just across the Red River here in the southern portions of Oklahoma and the Dallas and Fort Worth area that is where the threat it will be and then Friday morning we will see some strong storms in the northern Gulf from New Orleans to Pensacola to Panama City isolated tornadoes but a wind gust threat will be the biggest threat with this and Gotti in case you're wondering you're not done in California it looks like the next storm for you guys a little one on Sunday mostly northern California the next atmospheric river storm is possible Tuesday of next week. Wow. Hopefully that, that Sunday one is small, but that's wild. Another atmospheric river. It is just, it's something, those words we are so tired of yes. here in California right now. Bill, thanks so much. Okay. And Los Angeles is home to one of the biggest school districts in the country. And soon workers could be going on strike for three days, which means no school for over a half a million kids. Now, at the center of this is two unions. Those two unions represent over 60 thousand district employees. We're talking teachers, counselors, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians. They have been in negotiations for some time now, but the district hasn't met the union's request for better pay. This isn't the first strike in the district's recent history either. In 2019, about 30,000 teachers went on strike for six days in a push for higher pay and smaller class sizes. Joining us now is NBC News correspondent Nyala Charles. She's at LA City Hall right now. Nyala, uh, this strike will be happening. We just don't know win quite yet. What are you seeing there and what are you hearing from teachers? Well, what you're seeing right now here is the rally and what you're looking at here, Gotti, leverage together the teachers union and the education workers union, people like custodians and school bus drivers make up 65,000 people at, in the Los Angeles County School District and they're asking for higher pay more staffing and also better benefits in a time when they're in short supply so it's really hard for them they say they've reached a breaking point here since the pandemic they say things have not gotten easier they've gotten harder and they want better work conditions to reflect that because they say that also helps students listen to what one of the teachers is telling us 
I have a colleague and she right now has to babysit after work every day just to keep a roof over her head. So many of my colleagues have to have a roommate. Um, they have to work more than one job and that's just, it's just not right. Gotti, that teacher told me she makes $69,000 and the education workers on average make $25,000. So if it's hard for her, imagine how hard it is for the other people impacted by this. And that's the message that they're trying to send here, that their needs are a priority. Gotti? Uh, and Nayala, I know you spoke to one of the, the local presidents of one of the unions there. What are they concerned about? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You're right, Gotti. Yes, I did speak to uh, the president of the second largest teachers union in the United States, and she says what you're seeing here is reflective of the concerns of teachers across the country. Take a listen. There's a lot of turno turnover rates here, so we got to make sure that we keep people here. So these wages will make sure that we have better workers that come here and stay here instead of just having a attrition every year of 7,000 plus members. So the message being sent here is that teachers and education workers can't continue to work under these conditions. The Education Workers Union is the one hosting the strike. The teachers are standing in solidarity with them. The president of the Education Workers Union says unless they see a salary increase by 30 percent, they will strike for a proposed three days. So that's what we're waiting on right now, Gotti, to see when or if that strike will happen. And how is the district responding to all this? Well, the district says when it comes to the education workers, they've uh, agreed to raise those wages about half of what they're asking for. But the education workers union says that is far from enough. So give you an idea of the things they work with as people like the b school bus drivers, the custodians, other people that work within the schools. During the summers, we're told they're unable to work. So what that means is, although they still have a job, they can't work during those months. So that means they also can't file for unemployment. So that just increases the struggles that they face. He says a lot of them have to get second or even third jobs to continue to live in Los Angeles. And Gotti, you live here, you know it's expensive. On average, rent in Los Angeles costs more than $2,000 a month. Gotti. Nayella, with quite the show in behind you, thanks so much. And over in the finance world, that banking crisis that started last week seems to be spreading globally. Today, problems at the Swiss banking giant Credit Suisse spooked markets worldwide, dragging major bank shares here in the United States down with it. The New York Stock Exchange closed mostly in the red today. European markets closed even lower, something that honestly you don't see very often. And all this is happening after that quick yo-yo on Wall Street, the market dropping after the historic collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, then rebounding now dropping again. But here's the thing, this Credit Suisse situation, this is a whole different beast when you compare it to what we saw with SVB or Signature Bank. Credit Suisse has over a half a trillion dollars in assets, and all of this is sending shockwaves across commodities everywhere. To see how much more this downturn could spread, let's check in with NBC's Brian Chung. Uh, Brian, this is a lot of information. We're seeing all kinds of ripple effects happening. Earlier this week, we were told things were gonna be okay. What happened? Yeah, Gotti, it's a bit confusing, but essentially what happened today is that overseas in Switzerland, there appeared to be issues that seemed to resemble a lot of what we saw with banks here in the United States over the weekend. So Credit Suisse, it's one of the top 50 banks in the world, has been seeing some deposit outflows, and we saw shares of the company fall about 14 percent just today. Uh, this was all before we heard from the Swiss National Bank. It's the country's uh, central bank there saying that they would provide liquidity to the bank if necessary. Necessary, and that ended up reassuring markets, at least here stateside, that maybe one of the largest banks in the world wouldn't go under. For what it's worth, this is a bank that has had a history of issues, including the latest one, which you heard earlier this week, where management admitted to having material weaknesses in the way that they report their financials. So maybe a little bit of a different situation than what we saw at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature. But look, stateside, there are issues as well. We saw two ratings agencies downgrade another U.S.-based firm. It's called First Republic Bank. It's also based out of San Francisco. We're not seeing the same type of deposit outflows quite yet, but these ratings agencies saying it could be a risk, something we'll have to monitor in the days to come.
And Brian, when you think Swiss bank, the reputation is kind of like, this is supposed to be uh, some of the most secure banking systems in the world, right? Is this, is this at all linked to what's happening in Silicon Valley right now? Yeah, for what it's worth, the Swiss National Bank, again, the uh, credit, or rather the um, central bank in that country, has said that what happens in that country appears to be separate from what's happening here in the United States. But broadly speaking, the story is kind of the same. It's deposits that are leaving the bank. It's people that have money at that bank saying, eh, I don't really know if I feel safe keeping it in that bank. Now, people move deposits all the time. People switch banks all the time. But the issue is that if enough people withdraw enough cash fast enough, then it could lead to a really catastrophic issue like what we saw at Silicon Valley Bank and like we, what we saw at Signature Bank. Now, that's a concern over at Credit Suisse. It hasn't gone under or anything even remotely close quite yet, but there are concerns, especially after we got news that one of the largest investors in Credit Suisse uh, said that they wouldn't put any more money in, which again prompted the government through their central bank to say, we could help you out if needed. So it's not quite the same situation happening over there, but the sheer size of this bank, being one of the top 50 in the world, is what makes all of this so eye-popping. Uh, and Brian, here in the United States, even before this, it seems like all eyes are always going to be on the Fed hiking interest rates. Where does that stand right now? Yeah, Gotti, and the reason why we care about this is because their next meeting is scheduled for next Wednesday. Now, prior to all of this banking issues that we saw over the weekend, it was a pretty single-track mind for the central bank, right? Raise interest rates to take care of inflation, make borrowing costs higher, take steam out of this economy, and make inflation come down. But the issue is that one of the dominoes to fall that led to SVB collapse. It wasn't the only reason, but one factor was higher interest rates. So how can the Fed raise interest rates to lower inflation without breaking another bank? That's something policymakers are thinking about. Wall Street is pricing in a good odds of a quarter percentage point hike next week, although you have some Wall Street firms saying maybe the Fed's going to be even more cautious by not hiking interest rates at all. We'll have to see next week. Huh. Unintended consequences abound. Brian, thanks so very much. And still to come, the border, and no, not the southern border tonight. We are focusing on the north and a look at a new dangerous path some migrants are now taking to Canada. Plus, an abortion pill case in Texas could end up wiping medication from shelves, not just in the state, but across the country. That's all just ahead. And turning now to Texas and a very high stakes battle over abortion. A federal judge heard arguments in a major lawsuit there today trying to take one of two abortion pills off the market nationwide. And the lawsuit was filed against the FDA in November. And the anti-abortion coalition behind it is arguing that the FDA didn't do enough to evaluate the pill's safety before they approved the drug back in 2000, even though recent surveys show more than half the women who choose to terminate their pregnancies do so by medication abortion. So if the judge does rule against the FDA, the results could have a massive impact all across the country. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us now. Dasha, uh, talk to us about this case. I know that we're not going to see a decision just yet, but I've already seen some headlines suggesting that the, the judge might have had a lot of questions today about safety. What happened? Yeah, Gotti, first let me reiterate what you said there. While I'm in the small town of Amarillo, Texas right now, what happens in this court behind me could have major nationwide implications, regardless of whether you live in a state that has strong abortion protections or not. Uh, because what the focus of the hearing was today uh, was the plaintiff's request for a preliminary injunction in the case, which means that they're asking the judge to pull that drug, mifeprestone, off of the market while the case continues. Uh, if that were to happen, that would happen everywhere. And you're right, the judge did have a lot of questions today interjecting uh, in both the, the plaintiff's arguments and in the defense arguments. What we uh, heard from him was really drilling into the, the process um, and the protocol from the FDA when it approved that drug mifeprestone. That's, of course, at the crux of the plaintiff's arguments, that they're, they're saying that the FDA didn't properly uh, evaluate its safety. The FDA says, look, this drug has been on the market for for over two decades. Uh, the FDA cites data that says 5 million women have taken mifeprestone. Only 28 deaths uh, have occurred in relation to the drug since its approval in 2000. Uh, but the judge very much drilling down on, on process, on the powers um, that the FDA does and does not have to uh, to issue approvals like this. And uh, we'll, we'll see. We don't know when a ruling is going to come here, Gotti. 
And Dasha, this judge, he's not a stranger to controversy, right? Well, that's right. Look, uh, a lot of critics of this uh, case, of, of this being uh, brought to court in the first place, uh, say that the plaintiffs here uh, did what's called forum shopping, was it, which is essentially uh, trying to find a, a, a district and a judge that is friendlier to the cause. Uh, and the judge in this case uh, is a conservative judge. He was appointed by uh, former President Trump. And there's another recent controversy here with even how the hearing uh, was announced to the public. We know that on Friday, uh, the judge held a status conference with the lawyers where he told them there would be a hearing today, but asked them to keep it quiet. He said he wanted to uh, avoid any uh, demonstrations, avoid a, uh, what he called a, quote, circus-like atmosphere. Um, but of course, for, for the press and for the public, it is important to know when these things are happening. So after pressure uh, from media, he did ultimately uh, announce the hearing on Monday, but he had said he planned to wait until Tuesday evening to do so, Gotti. And, and Dasha, if this ruling does go against the FDA, what, what would be next? Would these pills get taken off the shelf immediately? Yeah, it's a great question. There is sort of a bureaucratic, complicated process for, for how that would unfold. And I think depending on what the judge says in his decision, that could have an impact on, on how quickly uh, that all unfolds and, and what that really looks like. But what we've heard from, from clinics, from um, uh, gynecologists, from providers, uh, they, they've said that this would really upend a lot of the norms. This would throw a lot of these clinics into chaos. Uh, scrambling to try to reschedule appointments, to try to uh, find other uh, methods and procedures for, for women seeking uh, ab abortion care. And they've already really been struggling and, and overwhelmed uh, in the post-Roe era. So this is yet another uh, challenge for those folks. And uh, apologies for the windy, <laughs> the windy backdrop here today. We're in the high plains, Gotti. A very windy backdrop indeed. Dasha, thanks so much. A number of migrants, mostly from Mexico, are taking a new path into the United States by taking flights into Canada, then making a dangerous trek into places like upstate New York. And the reason why it's dangerous, especially right now, is because the people making this trip are trudging through deep snow and frigid temperatures, all in the dead of night, a lot of them caught unprepared. Border officials say they are worried about below zero temperatures sending migrants into hypothermia. NBC's Julia Ainsley reports. Gotti, I'm here at the Canada-U.S. border. This is Canada right behind me just through these trees. And local officials here say they need more help from Border Patrol to stem what they say is a rising flow of migrants, mainly from Mexico, who fly into Canada and then attempt to come to the United States. These migrants think it's a lot easier for them to cross the northern border than the southern border, especially if they're trying to reunite with some family. Local officials, though, say they need more help from Border Patrol, that they're already straining the resources of these small towns to come out and rescue people in the middle of the night when they're often exposed to frostbite and hypothermia. We've talked to the fire chief here and local people in the local sheriff's office, and here's what they had to say. It's a pretty, pretty quiet town. It's a, we're a tight-knit community, uh, 3,600 individuals. Um, you know, and it's, yes, we are on a, we're a border town. You should expect certain things, but not in the, uh, not in the, the amount that it has exploded over the past several months. I mean, it's, it's, gone, it's gotten crazy. We're human beings, right? We, we don't differentiate those in need. We're gonna go where people need us, but our local population is not set up to care for the influx. Now, Border Patrol just last week did send 25 more agents to this area, and they say that's to deter migration. But local officials here still don't think that's enough, and they say this border is not secure. NBC's Julia Ainsley, thanks so much. NBC News has exclusive reporting on that Russia jet U.S. drone fiasco over the Black Sea. U.S. officials familiar with what happened are telling us that those aggressive actions might have been approved by top Russian leadership. Now, Russia says it's scouring the international waters for the wreckage right now. And the Pentagon points out that the part of the Black Sea where the drone landed is in as much as 5,000 feet of water. We also know that there is video of the mid-air collision. We just don't know when that video will be released. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has more. 
Hey, Gotti, good evening. Three U.S. officials familiar with the intelligence tell NBC News Russia's aggressive actions yesterday, including dropping jet fuel on the unmanned American drone, were approved by the highest levels of Russian leadership. Dropping fuel on the drone, on any drone, is an unprecedented action. Two of the officials said the intelligence suggests that Russia was apparently trying to throw the drone off course or disable its surveillance capabilities, but the actual collision with the drone, they say, was likely not intentional. The defense secretary for the U.S., Lloyd Austin, revealed today that he spoke with his Russian counterpart and made clear that the U.S. military will keep flying and operating wherever international law allows. Russia, for its part, insists the incident was an American provocation and says that its jet never touched the drone. Russian officials say they're trying to retrieve remnants of that Reaper drone in the Black Sea near Ukraine and Russia, but the Pentagon says it already erased sensitive information before most of the drone likely sank in as much as 5,000 feet. This afternoon, I pressed the White House's national security spokesperson, John Kirby, on the risks here. The problem with situations like this is that it can lead to escalation and it can certainly lead to miscalculation, misunderstanding by both parts. That's why it's important to have uh, the lines of communication that they remain open. This flight, whether the Russians liked the fact that we were flying it or not is immaterial. It was in international airspace, over international waters. We had every right to be there, and we're going to continue to do that going forward. When I asked Kirby whether Russia's actions were intentional or not, he told me, quote, it's possible that this was just a reckless, incompetent piece of aviation by the pilot. Gotti, the U.S. still does not know for sure. Back to you. NBC's Peter Alexander, thanks so much. When we come back, a helicopter theft gone way wrong. We're going to tell you about the attempted heist and the crashing failure. But first, you got to see this. NASA just unveiled its new moon suit, and boy, are they flexible. Astronauts are going to be dressed to impress when they set foot on the moon in 2025. The actual suits are going to be white to help reflect heat and keep the astronauts cool. There's even lighting around the head to help them see in dark craters, and obviously a video camera and HD so people back here on Earth can see what they're up to in credit. We'll be right back. And it's time now for some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. First, a helicopter heist in Sacramento, California. Early this morning, someone made their way onto the tarmac and broke into four helicopters. They got one off the ground, but quickly crashed it and took off. Police are still looking for the copter culprit. And seven people are in the hospital tonight after a tree branch fell on them at the San Antonio Zoo. Uh, you can see good Samaritans there rushing to pull it off of them. Five of the victims are kids. One of them is in critical condition. In Turkey, the same region that was hit with those catastrophic earthquakes is now dealing with devastating floods. At least 14 people have been killed by the torrential downpours. Rescue teams are still working to find five others. And students at Massachusetts Wellesley College say transgender men and non-binary students should be allowed to enroll at the all-women's college. But the school's president says the policy is not changing. In a statement today, she wrote, there is, quote, no plan to revisit our mission as a women's college or our admissions policy. And in Alaska, a new champion now reigns over the legendary Iditarod sled dog race. Ryan Reddington took home the win on what was his 16th try at the title, and that is a full circle moment for him. Ryan comes from a long line of mushers, including his grandfather, who was one of the founders of the iconic race back in the 1970s. Tonight, just like every night, thousands of people in this country are figuring out where they will sleep. There are more than a half a million Americans living without permanent housing right now, and high rent is making homelessness even worse. NBC's Jake Ward went to one California county that's working to find a solution. Here, let's play with these ones. For Jordan Silvera and her kids, after months of sleeping in hotels, on couches, and in her car, stable housing at the House of Grace in San Jose was everything. So this is actually the first apartment that me and my kids came and entered through. 
Wow. You walked through this door yes. and, and this was your first sort of refuge. Yeah, I was just like, this is where we live? You know, it was, it was very comforting. But for her and more than 500,000 Americans, shelter is not enough. They taught us life skills classes. We had financial literacy offered at the Career Center. Because you need to pick up skills that you just hadn't had the chance to develop before. Then. Yeah, and I hadn't had a bank account since I was like still 19 years old. The risk of becoming homeless in America has gone up for more than a decade, according to the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And the rising price of rent, coupled with inflation pressure, is not helping. Just a $100 increase in median rent was associated with a 9% increase in the estimated homelessness rate, according to a 2020 report by the U.S. Government Accountability Office. And that means this is not just a shelter problem. City Team, which runs this space, is one of several programs just in this county that literally trains people to stabilize their lives after being unhoused. At the height of the pandemic, we spoke with Maria Castaneda and her family living in city-built tiny homes after a period of homelessness. There is a heater which keeps us warm, and there's AC too when it was hot, so it's a good thing. Our own bed, warm, so it's, it was pretty good. Even though it's a small, but it's way better than where we were before. County officials say Maria has since moved on to a rental property and a full-time job. One of the things that's really impressive about this program is their permanency rate. People staying in housing after, you know, a, a year is 70 percent. County Supervisor Cindy Chavez says that while these 24 shelters and the services around them cost 1.5 million a year, that is nothing compared to the ongoing cost of homelessness. What we know is that if they're unhoused, we spend almost $65,000 a year per person for them to be unhoused in our community. Because that's what it costs in services oh to my help gosh. them out. Ambulances, being in custody, hospitals, mental health facilities. This county alone has allocated $643 million toward 5,000 units of housing. But in a state that is short millions of units, where Governor Gavin Newsom campaigned on closing that gap, housing is not enough. And the skills needed to survive while you're living in addiction or out on the streets are very different than the skills that are needed to survive while you're working. And as House of Grace renovates this apartment complex to add 50 more units, the physical space has to be designed not just for families. And so we're putting in bathtubs in a lot of the units. But for recovery from the trauma of homelessness. When women come from, you know, domestic violence situations or even living in a shelter, it can actually be really intimidating to be all alone by yourself in a space. Well, and we're so, comforting somehow to be within arm's reach of your child while yes, they sleep. Yes, exactly. Today, Jordan works for City Team, and her son attends school here. Like everyone we spoke to, she says without community, structure, and services, she would not have made it. Especially when you've just been in that cycle of shame and guilt and depression and all of these things, feeling like a failure, it's hard to get that courage to kind of step into that and know that you're worthy of all those things, like a job and a good life, a car, all these things. I truly believe the housing is, is a part of it, but I think it's so much more than that. Jake Lord with an incredible report. Jake, thank you. Seven states depend on the Colorado, for, uh, Colorado River for a water supply, but after more than two decades in drought, even with all of the rain, the crisis is still very much in effect. In Nevada, they're considering new rules right now that could cap how much water people use in their homes, and that's just one example of what's being considered. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson went down to the lower Colorado River Basin to see how communities are doing. All right, so we're right outside of the Los Angeles Bureau, right? This is something rare for this city, which is one of these winter rainstorms. It's gonna dump thousands and thousands of gallons of water on top of us, swelling the LA River. Take a look at this thing. So this should end the drought, right? Well, not quite. That's because precipitation in California has no impact on one quarter of the water source here, the Colorado River, which has been in a 23 year long drought. This year, the U.S. government is planning to announce cutbacks in Colorado River water to the 40 million people who use it. To assess that impact, we started below Yuma, Arizona, with Tom Davis, general manager of the Yuma Waters Association, providing water to farmers along the U.S.-Mexico border. What happens in five, ten years when there's still no resolution? Do you see that scenario? Are you worried about that? Do I see a solution? I don't. If the drought persists, the reservoirs go dry. It's that simple. We drove through acres of farmland, giving us a glimpse at why this area produces most of the winter vegetables grown in the U.S. between October and April. Eventually, we found ourselves on the other side of the border wall, but still on U.S. soil. 
After a few miles, we had to turn around. The U.S. Border Patrol was processing migrants who had just come across from Mexico. So we doubled back to get a good look at the river. Now we're, we're on the other side of a wall, but yes. that doesn't mean we're in Mexico, right? That's right. Okay. So That's right. Well, let's, let's walk. Where are sure. we? Uh, over here, it looks like a riverbed. Mm -hmm. It is. Is that the Colorado? That's the Colorado Riverbed well, right there. Why is it dry? Yeah. So this river is always dry at this point. So that's the border. This is the United States. And that's Mexico. That's right Mexico over there. on the other side. On the, the other river side is of the border. Dry. We Here, the down. river is always dry. At this point, California, Arizona, and Mexico have already siphoned off their allotted amounts of water. The fact that it's dry here, a symbol of that? It is. Every drop of, Cal of Colorado River water in the United States is accounted for. From Yuma, we went to Imperial County, California, the other key producer of winter vegetables and another big user of Colorado River water. Just outside of Holtville, we found Jack Vesey's farm. Jack was kind enough to drive us to one of his fields being harvested. Uh, we're farming approximately like 10,000 acres. 10,000, yeah, that's big. Yeah, I told you it's going to be beautiful. It's harvested a windstorm. How about that? Let me grab one of these. Thank you. So this is just part of like just crop safety? Yeah, food safety. Food safety. Yeah, it's okay. mandatory of our standard operating procedures. To, everybody wears a hairnet to go gotcha. out to field. What else have you had to do to sort of mitigate because of the crisis? Does it feel like you guys are being asked to do too much? No, I mean, I, I think as a farmer, most of my neighbors and the farmers here locally, we understand that we need to be part of a solution. We work so fast and so efficiently. It's amazing. Look how quickly they are with the knife. They put it into those boxes and they ship it right off to the grocery store. Irrigation runoff from farms like Fessy's flows north into the Salton Sea, the biggest lake in California. But as farmers conserve water, the sea has been drying up. And as the winds picked up, so did the dust. What do you see when you look out the window? Uh, it's hard to see anything, Mitch. It's really hard to see anything. It's dust everywhere. We headed right for the heart of the Salton Sea to a restoration project aimed at reducing all that dust from areas of the dried lake bed by restoring wildlife habitats. Hi there. So it's a very windy day. Very windy, as you can see. So watch out. It's a very uneven surface here. Definitely don't want to have any accidents. Yep. So you'll see here we, we have a very soft soil and then it gets a lot harder, so yeah. There you go. And uh, that feels a lot better. <laughs> so this is, here. But this is what it's all about, right? I mean, yeah. So as you can see here, the sea is receding. Yeah. Uh, How fast is this receding? How when I started working here, this was underwater. All of this was underwater. All of that was underwater. Where we yes. were standing, was this underwater? Totally underwater. We would yes. be underwater right now. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yes. Hi. Can you get that back at this point? Uh, you would need to have some sort of a flood event. The mini reporting hats of Steve Patterson. Steve, thanks so much for that report. And this next story I'm, I'm nervous about because it could divide our country. The U.S. has a new favorite dog. And I'm sorry to tell all you lab lovers out there that NBC's Sam Brock has a surprise. He's got a story that is unleashing quite the debate. To wear the crown of most popular canine, it's really a dog-eat-dog -dog competition. But apparently America has spoken, and the answer is the French Bulldog. My buddy, she's my best friend. The like, sweetest dogs, crazy too. They're a lot of balls of energy. The Frenchies really lapping up the limelight after the American Kennel Club announced their registrations leapfrogged the previous title holder for three plus decades, Labrador Retrievers, <laughs> who have a bone to pick with that dethroning. And so do their owners. I'm a lab mom for life. And why is that? I think because of my lifestyle and their lifestyle. Third on the list, Golden Retrievers. Are you surprised that the French Bulldog is now the most popular dog in America? Mm, they're expensive, they're cute, you know, but I, for me, it's not for me. Perhaps we should have seen this coming oh, after the winner of this year's dog show was, in fact, a French Bulldog. If it wasn't a healthy breed, I wouldn't have stuck with them. If it wasn't a joyful breed, a breed that you know, loves kids. I wouldn't have been in it. Critics have called for more oversight on their breeding and in some countries, bans based on their flat faces that can lead to a host of health issues. 
But as the owner of Dog Bar in Miami Beach points out, they're the perfect dog for modern day America. And a French bulldog just wants to sit on the couch and watch TV with you. Whether sleeping or show stopping, there's clearly a new sheriff in town. Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami Beach. What a rough assignment. Up next, the future of everything. And by now, we all know that 3D printers can make your glasses, your shoes, even your nightstand. But what about an ear or a human heart? How far off are we from that kind of future? We're going to show you coming up. Plus, you know how we're getting totally dependent on Google Maps, whether we're traveling five hours or, or maybe just like five minutes away? Well, that dependence on GPS might be hurting our cognitive skills. That's ahead. So stay tuned. They take the brain effort out of it, and it may be doing us a disservice in the long run. And when it comes to printing human body parts, the future is already here. Just in the last few months, we have seen some pretty incredible results. One woman received a 3D printed ear implant made from her own cells as part of a, a clinical trial. Doctors in France were able to grow a new nose for a cancer patient using 3D printed cartilage. And get this, researchers at MIT can now print 3D replicas of the human heart. The team has developed a robotic system to control soft 3D printed replicas of a patient's heart that can be actuated to mimic the patient's blood pumping ability. The procedure involves first inverting medical images of a patient's heart into a three-dimensional computer model, which the researchers can then 3D print using a soft polymer-based ink. The result is a soft, flexible shell in the exact shape of the patient's own heart. Uh, wild, right? Anytime I see something like that, I call NBC News medical fellow, Dr. Akshay Sayal. He joins us now. Uh, doctor, oh, why does this matter? What implications does this have on the future of organ transplants? Yeah, good evening, Gotti. The, the simple way to put it is we do not have enough organs out there for all the people who need organ transplants. Uh, every year, there's about 100,000 people on the organ transplant list, and about 17 people die every day waiting for an organ transplant. So that's why you're seeing a lot of excitement about this. We really need a way to solve that shortage of organ transplants, you know, for patients who have kidney disease and heart disease and liver disease. Um, you and I spoke a few weeks ago about a patient who needed a heart transplant who almost didn't get one. Um, so that's really why you're seeing the excitement about this growing an organ in a lab as opposed to waiting for an organ to become available. And how does this actually work? Explain the process uh, from design and printing. We saw a little bit of the printing there uh, to physically making a 3D organ part for the, the human body. Yeah, it's, it's pretty complicated, but I'll try to break it down here. And basically, <laughs> what you do is you take a piece of tissue sample, or a little piece of sample of an organ that you want. Um, say you, you're in need of a kidney transplant. You can take a piece of that, about the size of a postcard, um, and you mix that with a bunch of fancy chemicals, and then you put that into a, literally a 3D printer. Um, so if you think about a colored printer that uses ink to, to you know, combine a bunch of colors together to get the final product, you're taking a bunch of cells, and you're kind of mixing them together and combining them together, and then a 3D printer kind of layers them on top of each other until you literally get a 3D printed organ. But Gadi, I think the most important point here to drive home, because this is coming from a patient's sample, you don't have to take those immunosuppressive medications, those, those medications that prevent uh, organ transplant rejection um, that can actually weaken your immune system and make you more likely to get sick from things like COVID. Uh, I was expecting like an hour long answer and I was ready for it. I was get, getting ready to sit down and listen to all of it. I don't know how you just summed that up in like uh, two minutes. I want to know, though, how is this even regulated? This seems like a very uh, brave new world. And, and how far off are we from seeing this become a, a huge thing that doctors and hospitals are, are using on a daily basis? Yeah, so the experts really at Wake Forest who are leading the charge of this, you know, they think about 10 years out is where we are right now. Um, and if you look, if you guess, you know, the most, the, the organ we're most in need of a transplant for right now, it's actually kidney disease. Um, I think it's about 90% of, of patients who are in need of an organ transplant are waiting for a new kidney. Um, is, like you see on the screen here, about 100,000 people waiting for an organ transplant. But to answer your question, we don't really know how it's going to be, relegated, how it's going to be regulated. I think that really the important thing to drive home is we need to 
to figure out ahead of time how we're going to get this to people who need it most. Because when we go back to the kidney, the people who need it most, over 50 percent of those waiting for a kidney are minority populations. You want to make sure they are included uh, in, in, in talks to get access to this as well. And I, I just want to wrap here, Gadi. I know I said this is 10 years out. For all those out there watching, it's not too late to be an organ donor. If you can, go to www.organdonor.gov. Sign up today if you haven't already. Dr. Akshay Sayal, every time I talk to you, you blow my mind. Thanks so much. Anytime. And if you're anything like me, you're not going to go on a road trip without your GPS. In fact, a, a survey last year showed that as many as 93% of drivers depend on GPS. But health experts say that relying too much on navigation apps is literally damaging our brain's ability to remember memories. Now, some good news. Our chief medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres, has a powerful way to restore the brain, and it looks like a blast. Kathy Bannister is finding her way. We're going down the trail in our northerly direction. Racing across the Arizona desert. My plan is to go up here north a little bit. Catch like her competition, in. she has only a map and compass. No GPS allowed. Okay, I can see the flag. This is orienteering. And for 73-year-old Kathy, the stakes are much higher than who wins the race. Are you doing this for fun? Are you doing this for exercise? I are you doing it. this to keep your brain healthy? All well, the above? All of the above. I do it for exercise. I do it because I love the puzzle. Solving okay. the puzzle. New research from McMaster University in Canada shows solving that puzzle is part of keeping her brain healthy. Scientists have found that using GPS does too much brain work for us. They're extremely convenient, but they take the thinking out of it. They take the brain effort out of it, and it may be doing us a disservice in the long run. Losing navigational okay. skills can okay. lead to cognitive decline, even Turn dementia. Around. But reading a map stimulates the hippocampus, the part of the brain responsible for memory, navigation, and mental mapping. By turning off the GPS and using a map instead to navigate through unfamiliar routes, we're training that part of the brain, and it's less likely to decline. People who participate in orienteering report better spatial navigation and memory, suggesting that by turning off your GPS and instead relying on a map could be beneficial to your aging brain. One of the first symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease is a loss of our ability to get from point A to point B. This is why orienteering may be a really beneficial way to stave off cognitive decline because it taps right into that thing that they're losing first. You don't have to get lost in the desert to get the brain benefits. Experts suggest changing your usual route turning off the GPS on routine trips, and getting lost on purpose for the challenge of finding your way. For Kathy, who has a family history of dementia, her good old map and compass could be the key to keeping her brain sharp. Dr. John Torres, NBC News, Cave Creek, Arizona. Okay. Getting lost on purpose? Sign me up. I will be taking a little bit longer to get home tonight. When we come back, Fruman University's basketball team made it to the NCAA tournament for the first time in four decades. But the problem? Their band is in Ireland to perform for St. Patrick's Day. But don't worry. We found some substitutes. That inspiring story is next. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I've never expected it, um, especially from being from an to school. University in Greenville, South Carolina, is in the NCAA tournament for the first time in more than 40 years. Only problem is the school's band is in Dublin, Ireland. The solution? Peyton Furtado from our affiliate WYFF explains. Be it the luck of the draw or the luck of the Irish, North Greenville University's marching band will play on the Furman Paladins at the NCAA first round. I'm just, I'm still taking it in. So. <laughs> we learned the Furman fight song. It's not an easy one, but uh, we, we put some time in to, to, to learn that. Furman's marching band was invited to play in Dublin for the 2021 St. Patrick's Day Festival. It would be the first time Furman's band had traveled outside the country since 1986. But there was just one problem. At the start of COVID, nobody was traveling at that time. So the trip was postponed from 21 to 22. And finally, it became a reality and we were finally able to make that trip. The year the Furman Paladins made it to the NCAA for the first time since 1980. 
here we are in Ireland and they were all gathered around one computer screen on Sunday night to see Selection Sunday. And they cheered and yelled right here in our hotel in Limerick, Ireland, just you know, wishing that they could be a part of that. We had a little watch party and we were running around our entire music department hooping and hollering. Luckily, Furman had already drafted former student and North Greenville marching band director Gary Roden for assistance. Being an alum, I, I couldn't say no. Uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity. Uh, excited for our students. They don't, you know, us being a Division II school, we don't get opportunities like this very often. Students like Marquel Littlejohn, who had never been on a plane, let alone had an opportunity like this. And after several weeks of hard work preparing for Orlando, the trumpet player says he's thanking his lucky stars to be here. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I've never expected it, um, especially from being from an official to school and being uh, asked to be able to do this. It's amazing. I'm so ecstatic for it, and I cannot wait. Now let's just hope that the band in Ireland brings back some of that luck of the Irish. Thanks so much, Peyton. That does it for us. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We're going to see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.